Hello and welcome back to my channel. Now this is the fourth in a series of videos that I'm making as we approach the 400th anniversary of the 1623 printing of the first folio, i.e. the works of Shakespeare. It is to be expected that sometime in 2023 a document may surface which will prove without doubt that Sir Francis Bacon, statesman, lawyer, writer, poet and scientist, was behind the Shakespeare plays and sonnets. If you would like to hear more about this and just why a group of people would conspire to anonymously present works using an actor called William Shakespeare as their mask, please take a look at the part one video that I made and I'll put the link to this in the notes below. In this video, however, I'll be looking at code and cipher in the dedication to the sonnets which were printed separately in 1609. They are attributed to Shakespeare, but are again the work of Sir Francis Bacon, as you'll see. I'm now going to switch to sharing my screen so I can show you some things that you may not have seen before in the works of Shakespeare. Thanks for watching. So here, side by side, is the cover and dedication page for Shakespeare's sonnets. But what I'd like you to notice is that the word Shakespeare's is separated into two words. Now at that time in history, different spellings of words and names was not that uncommon. In fact, according to one website, various sources from William Shakespeare's lifetime spell his last name in at least 80 different ways. You can see here that in an even earlier publication to the sonnets, Shakespeare was all one word and spelt the way that it is today. Yet in 1608, four years later, on the first quarto of King Lear, the word Shakespeare was separated and the E was not included. You will note this means the break for the hyphen comes after four letters. Now do bear in mind before I proceed that as explained in my previous videos, the use of code and cipher in this era was commonplace. And in those videos, I have already explained the reasons why. So here it is sufficient to say that we should take notice of divisions in words like this, as they could sometimes be used as a way of drawing the attention of those with the eyes to see to the presence of a hidden message underlying the overt one. Also in those videos, you'll see that I turn my attention to the sonnet's dedication. And I notice the four corner letters, which is a known type of code, shown here by the squares, work out to produce the simple cipher for the name F. Bacon. But right now, I'm turning my attention to the cover of the sonnets. And because the break in the word Shakespeare comes after five letters, one, two, three, four, five, and there's a pluralization, I could see that this layout may be trying to draw attention to the fact that there are five S's in this arrangement. Additionally, because this is a book of sonnets which are delivered in iambic pentameter, penta meaning five, and so iambic pentameter means the sonnets are written in five sets of alternating stressed and unstressed syllables, that really got me thinking. Because those of you who are familiar with esoteric wisdom will know that the number five is associated with Venus and love and beauty, and one might indeed expect to see something symbolically relating to love represented on the cover of a book of sonnets about love, especially because in that era the use of number was often used in a talismanic way to invoke the luck and meaning associated with the number being used. It stuck out to me though for another reason and this was that the fact that number five is also a part of one of Francis Bacon's favourite and most famous and enduring ciphers, the biliteral cipher. And this made me wonder whether it may be present in the sonnet's dedication. So before we look, I'm now going to explain that cipher to you. Here on the screen is a picture from the George C. Marshall Foundation. And if you click on the link in the notes, it will take you to the video on cryptography, which fully explains it. Alternatively, you can go to this article, which I'll also link to. It's by the same person, William Sherman, explaining how to make anything signify anything. Back to the picture, though. To give you the gist, what you are looking at here is a group of code breakers, also known as crypt analysts. 
They have been arranged in such a way by the infamous crypt analyst duo Elizabeth and William Friedman to secretly spell out Francis Bacon's famous quote from 1597, knowledge is power. Now, Actually, Bacon never said those precise words. He said knowledge itself is power, but everyone uses the shorter version. And we know it was a really favourite phrase of the Freedmans because it can also be found on their gravestone in Arlington Cemetery. Back to the lineup, though. You've just heard the importance of the symbolism of the number five, but throughout the works of Shakespeare, the number invoked the most and which you will find absolutely everywhere, including in the infamous to be or not to be quote, is the number two. This again, as I explained in my previous videos, relates to the duality of life. So light and dark, ignorance and wisdom, mortality and immortality, etc, etc. And it's symbolised in the Rosicrucian Masonic Brotherhood and the wisdom tradition by the twin brothers, the Gemini twins, Castor and Pollux. So it's unsurprising that Bacon devised a cipher that is based on the number two and duality, hence why it's called the bi literal cipher. The premise of this is that you can take two things, and that can be two of absolutely anything of your choosing, whether it's apples and bananas, two different lengths of lines, two differences in the colour of something, or in Bacon's preferred case, two differences in font. And you can make these differences spell out secret messages. In this case, use was made of people looking in two different directions. Each group of people is divided up into five, and depending on which way they were looking, the binary biliteral code, i.e. Bacon cipher, will spell out words. So here one person looks to the front, and that's going to be an A. And then the next person looks away or to the side and the next two back to the front and the fifth person looks away. This will give you the ABAAB. -A -A -B. You can see that here. And when you go to the key and look that up, that is going to correlate to a K. And then you look again at the picture and it's going to give you an N and O and so on and so forth and then you can come to the end and wrap around and come back again. But you always divide up into five. So anyone looking at this would just think it's an ordinary picture. Only those who knew to look for code would see the anomalies, so it's very clever. One of the ways this method was used by Bacon in the works of Shakespeare, however, was through the use of a biformed alphabet. In other words, he used two slightly different font faces and doing this one can hide all manner of information underlying the words that the public who are reading it are totally unaware of. So this is an example of one biformed alphabet that was in use. Notice some letters were very obviously different. Look at the M's here, but the O's are very slight in difference as are the T's. Sometimes when secrecy was of the utmost importance and the difference would have been so small that you would require a magnifying glass to see the differences. What may now become apparent then is that on the cover and dedication of the sonnets there are two different types of T and in these two T's there is a very slight difference. Now just before I show you what I found in the sonnets on the cover and the dedication, I'd like to just address the elephant in the room, which is that although the National Security Agency and GCHQ and every other security agency are very open about Bacon's biliteral cipher and other ciphers, since the report published by the Freedmans in 1957, in which they publicly said they'd failed to find any hidden messages in the works of Shakespeare, this view has been parroted by academics and Stratfordians, and the whole idea of ciphers in Shakespeare has been dismissed. However, it has now been discovered in a paper which you can find on academia.edu, which I link to in my notes below, that the Freedmans appear to have not been telling the truth. Now, I'm fully aware that when one intimates that there has been a suppression of information, then one is automatically moving into the realms of a conspiracy theory. But as I often say, I am certainly not a conspiracy theorist, especially in the sense that there's some secret cabal who are all plotting for world domination. 
I prefer to apply rational thought to the subject as to why Friedman's public report might not have reflected the private views or findings of the Friedmans. It might well be that for the general global public good at that time, and to some extent even today, to have exposed the public to the notion that a Rosicrucian Masonic group of people in Garter Knights were actually behind the plays of Shakespeare could well be something that for reasons of national security it was thought best not to reveal at that time, especially in a very religious country like America where tensions towards Freemasonry are often high in some states. There may also be other considerations for places around the world because Shakespeare is obviously a worldwide phenomenon. So what I'm saying is suppression of information is not always a bad thing. Sometimes it's for the greater good or for reasons that can't be explained in a few sentences or it's because people really need to get on board with what the reality is behind the conspiracy myths before they can be taken further down the road to understand what was going on here with Shakespeare. So I encourage you to read the new paper about the Freedmans by my friend at the Bacon is Shakespeare YouTube channel and see for yourself what the full story is. But what is clear is that William and Elizabeth Friedman ensured that when they died, their tombstone would include the knowledge is power, quote, and also include secret code. And if we return to the picture of that stone on their grave in Arlington Cemetery and look more closely at the quote, knowledge is power, we see that the biliteral cipher has been used. And you can read all about that at this website here. You can also read all about the numeric code on the tombstone via the aforementioned link in the notes to the new Friedman study. Also on screen you can see that I make reference to the book which is widely thought of as the key that Francis Bacon left behind to enable future generations to decipher what code and cipher were in the works. This book was published less than a year after the first folio and you can find it at this link and I really do encourage you to visit it even though it's in Latin and to scroll through the pages because page after page you're going to see the most ingenious ways in which they uh, used code and cipher to hide information. Just the cover alone is fascinating and you can pause the video here to read this slide but as I say I do encourage you to go and look at the book itself. So now to what I found in the sonnet's dedication. I applied the biliteral cipher to the cover and to the dedication and in the dedication because all the letters in the wording appeared to be of the same font face here. I used each of the full stops as the biliteral marker. So a letter was A and a full stop was a B in blocks of five, like so. So here the first five letters would read A A B A A and the second five letters would read A B A A A and so on and so forth. However, I couldn't divide up this uh, dedication evenly and I couldn't make any sense of the letters that it did produce. So then I stood back and I thought well I'm sure the biliteral cipher has been used here. How has it been used? And I thought what's unusual about this dedication? And I put myself or tried to put myself in the shoes of Bacon and his Rosicrucian brothers of the time and I felt strongly that they would deliberately have left some clue to help us along. Now some may think it was the triangular printing but that was pretty common at the time and while along with the full stops it might alert us to the presence of cipher in here as I covered in a previous video what I've since realized is that what stands out is the fact that there are two so here we've got the duality again and everything in Bacon's life remember is doubled um, two words that were hyphenated 
And that mirrors the fact that on the cover we've got Shakespeare hyphenated and it comes after five letters and five letters relates to the biliteral cipher. So when I did this, I found that we get an exact match to the length of the dedication, which meant that I was probably on the right track. So then I looked to see what it translates to and it translates to all these A's but then there are two C's here. Now obviously all the A's and two C's don't make any word but C equals 3 in simple cipher and so I could immediately see the 3 3 Masonic cipher here and also 3 3 a simple cipher for Bacon. I then looked at the fact that there are 27 of these A's, which all, are, all of them can be given a number 1, and both of these can be given the number 3, and when you add that together, it also comes to 33, Bacon in simple cipher. Furthermore, C in Roman numerals, so CC is 200, and 200 is Francis Bacon in reverse cipher. So yet again, we are finding good confirmation that Bacon was the author. As we know, he did like to encode his own name. And here we found that he has done it repeatedly in the dedication. Now, there's been much discussion about who this dedication is written to. While there are some clues within the sonnets themselves to suggest the fair youth is the Earl of Southampton, this would require the reversal of this WH here to HW, as the Earl's name was Henry Risley, spelt with a W, so HW. My belief is that while both are given a coded mention in various sonnets, in this dedication the letters are correct and it is W.H. William Herbert who was also a fair youth to whom they were dedicated. So here's something from Shakespeare's birthplace actually uh, that talks about W.H. Um, William Herbert as the fair youth and who his dark lady might have been. But I think that's mixed up with the Earl of Southampton as well being mentioned in the sonnets. So let's look at why I'm so convinced that W.H. is William Herbert is who this uh, dedication is written to. Many people are not aware that there were two covers to the sonnets printed at the same time. Again, this is absolutely in line with the whole twinning theme. It was a signature of the Wisdom Tradition and the Rosicrucian Masonic Brotherhood. You'll notice the covers are identical in every way except for the details of the bookseller. Now, the overt explanation is that there were to be two distributors to ensure it reached as many people as possible. But as you can see here, Thomas Thorpe has a whole mystery around him. And actually the TT on the sonnets cover and on the dedication is a well-known Masonic cipher. So the TT I believe is alerting us to look further and although I could not apply the biliteral cipher to the cover as I just found there were too many changes of font to make sense of it when I looked at it as an anagram lo and behold the one says Francis Bacon and W Herbert so here we have the F R A N C I S B A C O N and W Herbert's in there too. As I often say to others though, we do have to be careful with anagrams because there are so many words that can be made given enough letters and vowels. However, you have to agree that this is interesting when the other imprint here lacks a C and an H and so won't make either of those names. And furthermore, by using Christ Church, it introduces two C's. So that's the same as the double C that I found in the dedication. And it allows us to make the name Francis as well as Bacon. As to William Herbert, well, both he and Henry Risley and Francis Bacon 
were mentioned in the 1609 Second Virginia Charter, 1609 being the same date as the printing of the dedication and the sonnets. So although we know that the sonnets themselves were written in the late 1500s, the dedication would have been written around the time that they were printed in 1609. The dedication also mentions an adventurer setting forth. Not only is this a metaphor for seeking out the deeper mysteries of life, as those in search of higher awareness and knowledge were sometimes referred to as travellers or navigators, but in the 1609 charter, as you can see here, the committee members were referred to very specifically as adventurers. Plus, William Herbert W.H. was specifically mentioned by full name along with his brother Philip in the front of the first folio. And here you can see that William Herbert was a member of the Brotherhood. In fact, in 1607 he was a Grand Warden and by 1618 he had been made a Grand Master and he remained in that position until his death in 1630. So if you were in any doubt that the Rosicrucian Masonic Brotherhood were behind the works of Shakespeare, I hope you are now assured that they were. But just in case you're still in doubt, here is the record of W.H. William Herbert as a Grand Master in the Book of Constitutions by James Anderson. So if you have found this video interesting and would like to learn more about how the early Freemasons were involved in the founding of America, and the Rosicrucians and learn all about the secret ciphers, clues and codes they passed on and left for others in buildings, monuments, paintings, books, seals and many other locations and how there is absolutely nothing nefarious or sinister about this then please go to the-secret-work.com and purchase my ebook, which is replete with further interesting information that really could revolutionise your understanding of our world. Thank you for watching.